So Clark Shuttle has been involved with historic preservation for over 50 years. He has a graduate degree in historic preservation from the University of Vermont. He established the National Main Street Center at the National Trust for Historic Preservation and was the executive director of the Providence Revolving Fund for 35 years. During that time, he was responsible for the historic renovation of 450 historic residential and commercial buildings throughout Rhode Island. He currently serves on the Providence Historic District Commission, the Providence Downtown Review Commission, and the Rhode Island Historical Preservation and Heritage Commission. He lives in Providence, but the most important thing is that he's also a Little Compton resident, and he has been delightful to work with on this project. So please join me in welcoming, welcoming Clark. Thank you. Thank you, Marjorie, for that nice inter introduction. And um, the, uh, up here and joining us online, uh, consider this a sneak preview of what you will see when you go on the tour later in September. If you're unable to go on the tour, which would be unfortunate, um, consider this an opportunity to see the houses and read the houses, even though you can't see them in person. Tonight, I'm gonna to try to give you a framework for how to read a house. And what I mean by reading a house is understanding the style of the house, understanding what makes, what, what is original to the house or what is um, typical of that style. And then also being able to identify what changes have been made to the house. And I think the combination of those three pieces are, it's sort of like a puzzle because you're dealing with a house that might be 200 years old and a lot of different things have happened and it's hard to kind of figure out the, the chronology of, of what's happened to the house. And I think by putting together that puzzle or trying to get that, under, get that understanding, you end up with a, a greater appreciation for the house or for any house that you, that you go into. And I mean, I can't go into a house without sort of saying, oh, that doesn't look right. And I want to go over and look at it. And, and uh, sometimes the host doesn't really appreciate that. But, 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 that's, but that's sort of my, uh, my problem, I guess. Um, in the process of, of sort of doing that analysis, um, you often come across sort of surprising results that you didn't expect to see. And that's what, that really is what the excitement is, at least for me when I go into a house is to try to um, be a sleuth, I guess, and figure out what, what's what, and also maybe find things about a house or a style or a period of a house that I didn't know before and, and see it for the first time. Now, I gotta figure out how to do all this together. Whoop. No. Are you in or am I out? No, mine, mine working, so. So what we're gonna to do tonight is take a look at five. Oops, gotta move that off of there, sorry. Tonight, we're gonna to take a look at five residential houses on, that'll be on the tour and also include the old Quaker Meeting House and the Wilbur House, more as a reference than taking a really deep dive into those houses, into those two buildings. Every house is served has, has been occupied by several owners. Many have been occupied by family, families for generations. Regardless, all, the, all of them have gone through renovations and additions, which represent changes in taste, technology, and how we live. For example, pretty much all of the older houses, especially um, on this tour, were built without central heating, without central heating systems, electricity, bathrooms, any plumbing, and what we might call a functional kitchen. So, so all of those houses have been upgraded over time uh, to, to, to um, acquire all of those things. And often that causes changes to the exterior uh, where rooms get added or dormers get added. And, um, and it's sort of nice to be able to kind of peel apart those pieces and see, see what the house, how the house has changed over time. 
every time a house is renovated, decisions are made on what to preserve and what to change. And it's a continuous process. And when you try to read a house, you're trying to look for evidence of those changes and the impact on the original fabric. And it's sort of like peeling back, as I say, sort of the layers of history in the house in order to have, have a better understanding of it. In many instances, preservation, rehabilitation, and restoration are combined in a renovation of a house. Uh, the definition of these are, is sort of, um, is, is something that actually the National Park Service has, has defined. Preservation focuses on the maintenance, repair of existing historic materials and the retention of the property's form as it has evolved over time. Rehabilitation acknowledges the need to alter or add to a historic property to meet continuing and changing uses while retaining the property's historic character. Restoration depicts a property at a particular period in time in history while removing evidence of the other periods. Restoration obviously is the hardest one to read because everything's been peeled away all the way back to the very beginning. So there's no way from to easy, easily see uh, the, the history of, of what's happened there. And then construction would be the last category, which is recreating um, uh, something that's, that hasn't survived or is vanished uh, and, and interpreting it as, as a historic building, much the way, uh, say, historic Williamsburg is, is almost all uh, an interpretation of what was there based on the foundations that they uncovered when they excavated it in the 1930s. In many, in the, 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 the tonight, I, I'm going to, I'm going to try to, I tried to organize the house in, in the periods in which they would, were built and, and was sort of interesting um, the way that sort of laid out. The, um, we have the colonial, the colonial period, which, which would roughly be between 1670 and 1790. And in, within that period, the Seaborn Mary House, um, the Wilbur House, and the Wanagan, the old part of the Wanagan uh, property are, are all within those dates. So Seaborn is 1733. The, the sort of colonial period of the um, Wilbur House is, or the way it looks now, is, is 1748. And the, um, the Wanagan uh, property was the, the original kernel of that was 1779. Then I'm going to jump to the federal period. And federal generally sort of is, is after the Revolutionary War, because no longer is it colonial. And um, so the federal period is basically from 1785 or so to about 1825. And interestingly, on this tour, we have the four properties that are that are uh, federal period buildings. Um, and starting with the windmill that ends up in the mill house, the windmill was built in 1812. The Quaker Meeting House was built in 1815. Uh, the the uh, Brownell Farm House was built in 1815. And the church house in Adamsville was built in 1815-16. So, so there are, it's, it's sort of interesting to have that close of a grouping of, of four different properties. And then the final category would be Victorian. And the Victorian period would really go from uh, 1860 uh, to 1900. And, and it really uh, corresponds with this sort of industrialized period uh, in, in the United States when, when uh, product was being uh, mass produced and, and uh, mantelpieces and handrails and newel posts and all these things were all being produced at factories rather than being produced by hand as, as the colonial and federal houses were often being produced sort of on site by carpenters. And, and uh, the Victorian period also then spans many uh, styles. And so there, there, there would be like the Italianate style, Gothic revival, Queen Anne style, the shingle style, the colonial revival, all sort of are lumped in as Victorian. Um, even though uh, you would think previously every every one of those styles would have been sort of an individual little piece because that's all that uh, the 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 contractors were were building basically they were very limited to the pattern books that they were using uh, to give them guidance as to, as to what style they should use 
and architects were starting to to become uh, more more prevalent, and there were pattern books that were uh, sort of mass producing building plans so that people could could everybody could sort of have access to um, building these new styles. And then also what what ends up happening though is even though there, all these styles exist, they all are sort of using component parts that are the same because they're all being bought from the lumber yards and and from uh, the, uh, the different shops that are producing things. So that there might be fundamental um, uh, characteristics that identify the style that make it look uh, Gothic or make it look Italian. But basically all of all the interior uh, finishes and uh, and doors and things like that, in a, in a lot of instances, they're they're almost identical from one in one style for another. So it's sort of it's sort of an interesting uh, uh, period of what when that happens. So so we'll be looking at the the mill house, the mill house, uh, the Kempton Kempton house, and I'm not going to look at one again 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 because we're going to really look at both both iterations of it. But one again is is also a 1918 uh, shingle style colonial revival house that basically incorporates the um, the earlier earlier building. So. And let me just say a disclaimer: if I if I make mistakes in terms of what I think I've identified, don't shoot me because I I only went into the houses once or twice, took some photographs, and these are my observations. And those of you that know the houses better than me uh, could could maybe shoot holes in it. And if you can't shoot a hole in it, uh, let us know and and correct us correct me if you, if you can. Oh, sorry. So I was going to start with Wilbur House, which is a 1950s house museum, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. Um, and it's a restoration of a building that really had undergone three significant um, rehabilitations or adaptations over its 300 year history. And, and so it's sort of a great uh, vehicle, I guess, to, to show different styles. And the house on, this is the house on, the, uh, on, on your left. Um, and it really was a Greek revival house when when it was restored. But the Greek revival house ended up getting the Greek revival features of the house ended up getting sacrificed as part of the restoration because the concept was to be able to uh, move the um, or to to peel back parts of the house to to expose the 1691 earliest part of the house, the 1748. Uh, sort of colonial part of the house, and then later a portion of the the back L as the 1860 house. So, so what ends up happening is that the that that we lost the Greek Revival character that this house looks like at this point, even though it still has the center chimney and and looks like a colonial. Um, so it's it's sort of like this weird. Um, only in a restoration would you probably do this the average home homeowner probably would never do this but so uh what what happened in this instance the six over six windows um were were taken out and 12 over 12 and eight over eight windows were or four eight over 12 windows were were installed and in in the front part of the house and um and inside all of the greek revival mantelpieces and and the accumulation of, of changes on the inside were all stripped back to 1748 uh, in this instance. Um, and you can see, I mean, you all know the house probably, but, but this part is where the earliest part was, which would be the 1691 section. And then the 1748 house sort of env enveloped that, that section. So that's really sort of what how the house kind of reads today. And I just just quickly showing this sort of sort of strange concoction of of, of what's inside this built this envelope of a building, uh, showing the 1691 sort of great hearth uh, stone ender uh, look of the of, of what was built then the 1748 portion and the 1860 portion and. And these none of these would have ever existed together because at each stage the previous um, 
the previous stage would have been sort of redecorated to to represent the latest stage. So, so it's a, it's it's sort of a it's a great house in terms of being able to represent that, and, and it makes a great um, great house museum. First house I'm going to look at is um, it's really too bad that the top's getting cut off because so I'll try to read what's on it. Um, And now, because I'm missing my, the top of my thing. So, first house is Seaborn Mary House. We're going to look at this is 1733. And it's a very early, it's the earliest colonial period house that we're looking at. Um, and that would, it's really defined by the central chimney. And there's a gamble roof, which you'll see in a second um, from the side view. The gamble roof, you know, is sort of, the, sort of a, four, a four slope roof. This house um, was. In 1937, it was dismantled and moved from Londonderry, New Hampshire to Little Compton and then restored back to its 1733 appearance. And as I said in the beginning, this sort of corresponded with what was sort of the excitement that Colonial, Colonial Williamsburg was, was, was creating in, about colonial, early colonial houses. So I think that people were all, all of a sudden taking an interest in why you would want a desire to move a house dismantle it and move it from New Hampshire, except for to be kind of part of what was going on in Williamsburg. Um, what's interesting about this house is that the lower left-hand picture shows an 1895 version of the house. And you can see that it has um, 12 over 12 windows, which, which you know, could have, could have been in 1750. It could be in that, in that range, but, um, so that, that, they were 12 over 12 and in, in probably near the turn of the century or so, the house was, was modified and upgraded to be over two windows, which is the upper picture. And then when it was moved and restored, it was determined that the house really should have um, nine over nine windows and the window opening should be a little bit narrower. I, it, these are all just sort of observations. I have no idea whether uh, there was actually um, documentation or justification for that, or whether that was just sort of what the idea was in 1937. Best practices was that, that an early house like this should have nine over nine windows. But the pieces of glass are actually almost the same as the 12 over 12 windows. So I don't, it, it's not like it was because they couldn't make bigger pieces of glass. So, um, so anyway, so that's, that's a little conundrum that, that made me go, oh, that's sort of weird, but, but I, I don't have any answers for it. Uh, but you can often date a building by its window pattern and the number of pieces of glass in each sash. sash. And, and I, I should have said it at the very beginning, but I didn't, but um, that when you refer to windows, you normally refer to them by the number of pieces of panes of glass on each sash. So, when you would say eight over 12, it means there are eight, eight panes of glass on the top sash and 12 panes of sash in the lower, lower sash. So, so that's an eight over 12 window or a 12 over 12, depending on what, what it is you're talking about. But, um, it's, and that was really not because they liked the style of having the cute colonial windows, but it was because uh, glass was difficult to get and, and it was really all being hand blown. and. Um, and sort of what they did was they would blow the glass and then they'd spin it on this on the glass blowing rod. They would spin it and, and make make a sheet make a disc of glass that was about five feet in diameter, which is hard to even imagine. And then they would lay that down flat, and it would then it would um, it would harden, and then they would break break the puntal off of the center of it, and that is sort of the bullseye that you often see in in uh, Different in like front in front doors or, and that meant that they that they then had to divide this round piece of glass into squares to put on in the window. So you could get more squares out of doing little window little little panes of glass, and you could get not very many if you were doing uh, big pieces of glass. So as the glass technology changed, windows could window glass could become bigger and bigger because they had different ways of making glass and. And as soon as it was a bigger piece of glass that you could get, most people would say, I want that more modern window and uh, because it lets more light in. And so that's how windows evolved and changed over time in very old houses. 
And it's not that much difference. We're still, still doing it today with trying to update our older window to a insulated window and, and, and replacing all the old windows and putting an insulated window in, which I wouldn't do myself. But but anyway, but it's a uh, but that's but that is the 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 it was really about modernization uh, is why why things changed. So, um, so the next slide. So this this slide. Whoop. Sensitive. This slide, the right slide, the right slide shows the gamble roof of the older building, um, and probably the dormers were probably added. I don't think the dormers would have been in there to begin with, but it would have been just a, a window on each end of of uh, the building, and so that's the historic section. And then the owner has built a, a very nice um, contemporary addition that sort of picks up the 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 the, the sense of um, Form of the of the earlier gambrel, but in a much more uh, in much larger form, and obviously with with uh, more windows. Inside, again, I, this was a restoration, but it's also a restoration of a house that was taken apart and numbered and then put back together again. So you, you sort of never really know <laughs> how it all goes back together again. But um, but it but it, assuming most most of it's back together the way it was supposed to be. Um, and it's really it's really beautiful. It's it's there's basically the center hall, a center, a, a center chimney that goes up uh, through through more or less the center of the building. And then there's one room on this side, which was the kitchen, and the room on the other side is basically the living room or parlor. And so there are only two rooms on this floor, and then there are two bedrooms upstairs. So it's it's just really a, a very compact and, and tidy house. And you can see. It's a post and beam construction. You can see these massive beams, and they would be supported by or uh, tenoned in and then pegged with wooden pegs into um, into the frame uh, of of the house. This is the living room uh, side, and again, you can see these massive beams. I mean, these are sort of almost over engineered for only supporting a bedroom upstairs. <laughs> Um, but they didn't have engineers that were telling them how big the beam needed to be, so they just went for the size of the tree. Um, and then uh, you can see the beautiful wide planks uh, that are planking the walls. Um, presumably in 1937, uh, this house had glass and plaster on it and had already been modernized. So, but, but I think the planks would have been probably under the, 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 the lath and plaster, so, so that was all removed and, and the planks. Um, uh, restored because they're they're enormously wide, wide planks. Taking a close look, you can see the the beams are all hand hand hewn. So somebody with an axe or a or a um, an as uh, would would sort of just chop it away, and maybe they maybe they would plane it to smooth it a little bit. And then the floorboards of the bedroom upstairs, you can see the underside of of the boards. They have these vertical, the vertical uh, lines, which would have been the saw, the saw lines. I'm not sure that this board is probably an original, original to the building, but um, but typically the, the vertical lines would have been a reciprocal saw would have worked if it was a, a water powered sawmill. The, the saw would have just gone up and down like that. Or in the really early houses before they had those reciprocal saws, two men would operate a huge saw and one man would one man would be down in a pit and the other one would be above and the, the two of men would just was pull and and push and and cut the boards that way and so so these when you think about the labor intensity of this it's, it's sort of amazing and and um so it's so these are all sort of just like little clues about the house and and whether this is original or not a good effort was made to to replicate what what it would have been There are some things that are really pretty interesting, though. Um, the the door going into the living room. On either side of the door, one side has these circles, which are sort of like hex, kind of uh, warding off evil spirit uh, circles, I think. And and but we nobody really knows. But that's that they they've been there for a long time. And then on the other side of the door is somebody sort of put graffiti and carved in 1779. And for life of me, I don't know what 
I'm not sure what happened in 1779 that, that would have been uh, marked like that, but and I did look in New Hampshire. I went online and said, New Hampshire, 1779, what happened? And they actually passed some sort of a abolition, slavery abolition law in 1779. That was the only thing that came up, but I, I doubt that's what was why it was carved into this into this wall. But, And then also looking at the hardware, um, again, you know, I don't know, I don't know that much about early hardware. Uh, this looks pretty English on the the, the brass uh, hardware looks pretty English to me rather than American, but I, I don't know for sure. But I was really intrigued by the wooden, the wooden latch. And so this wooden latch works with a little spring, a, a, a sort of a, a, a little little splinter of wood on the top that is under pressure and pushes down the latch so that it locks itself, latches itself every time you shut the door. And I thought that was sort of intriguing, but I, I really doubt that it was original because you can see all the, you can see all these sort of mark, marks here, which indicate that there probably was other hardware on here before or after something like this might've been. So I, but it's it's an intriguing uh, piece of, uh, of of hardware. I'd never seen any, anything uh, like that. So. so that was sort of a discovery, I think. In, in, in. So the next house is is Wanagan, and Wanagan I think means welcome in Indian, some in maybe Ashwak, I, I don't know, uh, or Narragansett uh, language. Um, and this is this. House primarily reads as a 1918 colonial revival uh, shingle style house. But what is interesting is that it also incorporates a 1779, which interestingly is what was carved on, <laughs> in New Hampshire on, on the wall. But uh, it incorporates a 1779 house, which is sort of behind, behind the tree and this vestibule was added here, but back here is 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 the house, and so that's what you're seeing in the second picture. So that more or less, I think, is 1779. And this from the from the back side of the property, you can see the house more the house form more clearly, and so it's it's the big two and a half story uh, gable house. But and you can see the center chimney. Uh, poking up through the through the roof um, on the uh, on the left slide. The I love the dog. Too. It's a great name. Um, the the doors though the door that we saw on the front of the house going into the vestibule and this door never existed in 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 uh, at the period of the house and because actually the house had a side entrance which is what they connected. They connected the old old building to the new building through the original entrance, which was on the side of the building. So, so these two, um, these two, the front door and the back door, are these sort of grandiose, uh, sort of Georgian revival. I mean, they're they're more than federal. They're more than anything that you would have ever seen, probably in, in Little Compton for sure. Uh, they added these two to the front and the back of their historic sort of kernel of a house that they put in. And and this is pretty much a colonial revival uh, uh, treatment of a colonial revival house. Now it doesn't really go over overboard. Um, so it sort of diminishes the earlier house a little bit uh, because number one, it was never there, even though they you can't really see it. But in the if you go, there's like a little stone block up there that that says 1779 on it so it looks like the cornerstone for this this little house also which, which i don't think uh, i don't know when that was where that came from exactly but they stuck it in the pediment to make it make the door look even more authentic um, and let's see inside though there are remains of the old house which are which have been well kept and the current owners have done a just an amazing restoration of the building um, just in the in the last uh, last uh, three years or five years. And so what appears to be original is the wood paneling over the 
fireplace, uh, the use of marble, like, it, like the use of marble and the surround around the fireplace uh, would not have been from 1779 um, and is a newer addition. But the door, the door looks looks correct, and the paneling is correct. The paneling on the other side of the door, however, is all new. So they sort of they sort of ended up paneling the entire room in the restoration of, of the space. When oftentimes I think only one one wall might have been paneled, and the rest would have been um, would have been plastered. Um, but but there but this does remain. And the room next to that is is also, um, I think, original. Uh, the paneling over the over the fireplace is um, it appears to be correct, and you can see a sort of a close up of of the joinery of it. And what's fascinating is the uh, is the corner cupboard, um, which has really a pretty fine uh, level of 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 carving and, and detail, especially in the arch of, of the uh, corner cupboard. Kind of an interesting, the concept, I think, of building the, a new house, the, the old, the 1779 house was on the property sort of down closer to the ocean or to the water. And, and so they brought, brought that up and then sort of merged it in to, they, they merged the colonial house into a colonial revival house plan. And so it sort of gave uh, some credibility or some authenticity to their colonial revival because they actually had some colonial stuff in there. <laughs> and uh, it, it's, it's kind of a cool thing. And, and what they did, which I don't have, there was, it was hard to sort of capture it with pictures, but the, the other rooms in the 1818 house have the same, Height of the ceilings and as as the old part, so so they they sort of carried the carried the theme through. If you go, you have to go down. The gardens are beautiful, um, and at the end of sort of the far end of the gardens is this this barn and these wonderful donkeys. But the barn supposedly came from a mansion was was dismantled and brought over from Newport. Uh, from a Newport mansion that was getting rid of its horse barn. So, so the barn is, is quite interesting as well. Oops. And I want to take a quick look at the, at the meeting house, which is built in 1815. So now we're moving to federal period. And there isn't that much difference between federal and colonial, except that we're no longer a British colony, especially in the beginning. Um, it, it, the federal period ends up being much more refined uh, than colonial period buildings, mostly just because the technology continues to improve. Um, here you can see that before restoration, a vestibule had been added to the front of the front of the um, meeting house, and it was six over six windows. During the restoration, it was determined that the windows were smaller, and and so the upper story windows became eight over eight windows, and the lower sash or our lower windows are eight over twelves. Again, it's it's hard to it's hard to tell on on these things. I think because that there are plenty of buildings that were eighteen fifteen uh, buildings that that were using larger pieces of glass, but but in the rural areas, it probably would made sense that there would be smaller pieces. You can also see the the flanking chimneys, um, chimneys at each each gable end. Uh, that's much more of a federal detail than you would see in colonial uh, re colonial uh, houses. The meeting house is great because you can actually see sort of the timber framing, the, the post and beam framing, and how 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 it worked, even with a plaster wall. Uh, you can also sort of in, in sleuthing it a little bit, you can see see the little white lines on the brace board and the white vertical lines on that corner board. That basically indicates that there was a plaster wall. The, the wall was padded out at one point to kick, to create sort of an air an airlock in between the sheathing boards and the interior wall. Uh, in the really early buildings, the the plaster and lath would have been applied directly to the exterior sheathing board. So you can sort of see that this was had been uh, 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 different than what we're seeing here. And so in the restoration, 
they basically removed that sort of outer wall and went back to what they thought was was the the right um, right way to, to to do it. One of the bonuses this this building is so wonderful. It's so simple and so beautifully designed. I think, and the benches are all great and everything's beautiful. The most intriguing thing about this building and something I hadn't actually seen working anywhere else is you can see that bottom, the, the rail the running down the center of the building with the groove in it. Well, that is actually a sliding wall that comes down from the second floor and the, the boards on the sliding wall fit right into that groove tightly to, to physically separate men and women uh, from being uh, seeing each other during during their silent meeting. And you can see it from up here. Th this whole thing just kind of, there's a rope, you see that rope that's sort of sticking out there. It's on a pulley system, the whole thing drops down and, and separates the two sides. And there's a little, there's a little door here that can open so that you can get through if you have to, but. <laughs> Next federal period house is the 1815 Brownell farmhouse on West Main Road. And this had flanking and chimneys at, at one point, um, uh, one got removed, but it's pretty much a five day center hall federal building, which is pretty much your standard federal style that you would, that you would recognize. A little bit hard to see on a white and white building, but the, the, the lintels over the, 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 the boards over the tops of the windows are are splayed in, in sort of a V shape to 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 sort of uh, designate the the header on, on the on the door. And I, you kind of go, why why would they do that design? And, and it really is based on if it was a stone or a masonry building, they would have had they they the federal period they came up with that splayed lintel. Well, actually, it probably was in the Georgian period. Uh, British were using it for a while, for a longer period before before us, but it was a, a way to support the lintel without having a big chunky lintel block uh, go uh, go beyond the window. But it would spring from the the edge of the window and go go up diagonally, and that could support all of the weight above it. So it's really a masonry that was then translated into into wood. You also notice that the front of this building is clabbered. And if you uh, go on the tour, you'll be able to see the front is clabbered, the sides are shingled. Uh, in rural areas, that was a very common way to sort of save money. You sort of put your best face forward with the clabbered and, um, and, and the, the shingle could be where you, where you don't see it as easily. This, this basically shows the house with the other chimney and also with a sort of a later addition, which would be a very nice addition, I would think, would be to put a front porch on the house. And it's actually quite a beautiful front porch. Um, so, so this house had sort of gone forward and done some improvements. Uh, the owner of the house, uh, when it was restored, was um, Carlton Brownell, who was also uh, sort of supervised and was doing the, the restorations of the Wilbur House and the and the um, Quaker Meeting House, all sort of at the same time that this house that he was doing this house, and and so he was he was sort of peeling back the onion and and bringing it back to a, sort of a more pure uh, form of the uh, of the the, the seventeen the eighteen fifty front door very nice panel door facing outwards sort of an intriguing detail that I'd never seen before is this sort of weather stop where another plank or planking had been placed on the inside door so that when it's shut, it creates a weather stop and, and uh, quite intriguing, I think. And inside, you can see it's much more, it's just two simple boards uh, with, the, with the strap hinges and the metal uh, lock box and, and, uh, and the, this just reads very nicely. And it's a little, it's sort of a short hall. Um, the, the staircase is, is quite beautifully detailed. The uh, little um, uh, uh, thread, uh, tread, tread brackets there under the uh, stairs are, are quite nicely done. 
and uh, and and looks looks very original and and uh, and very handmade. I think very slender uh, balusters uh, also look look to be original. When oops, sorry, when I was looking at it, as I looked at it closer, though the the the, the picture on the left looks is, it looks completely wrong. The newel post is. The wood is just too nice and smooth, and the handrail is much too beefy for too too heavy for the for what would have been a, a colonial I mean, a federal period staircase. And so I was talking to Fred and saying, God, you know what what's the story with this? And and he said, well, we, there's another one in the back the back stair, which which is is I think original. And so we went in the back stair, and there is the exact same exact same uh, version. So this was. Probably this got beat up or something and needed to be replaced, and uh, and so this was a replica. But you can see on the top of the newel post, it looks like they salvaged the cap off of the earlier newel post and stuck it on top of the new new newel, newel post, which is sort of which is sort of neat. Also, another sort of surprise thing that that I noticed when I was looking at these things and. Sort of, you want to look at the doors and the moldings and things like that. And the picture on the on the left is in the hallway, and it's a four panel door, and nicely done. I mean, it's a beveled beveled panel and quite beautiful. And but then when you went into the parlor on the other side of that door, it's a six panel door, and I don't think I've ever seen that actually, where because normally the Normally, the other side of a four panel door would be four sort of straight uh, unadorned panels, and then the nice panels would be facing the other direction. But to actually have, actually be able to construct a six panel door on one side and a six panel door on the other side, um, I thought was quite, um, quite ingenious. And, and that's the way all of, all of the doors off of this front hall are, are designed, designed that way. Another intriguing surprise was in the parlor. I was I was looking at the shutters and thinking, well, that's nice. And and then I start I shut one of the shutters just to kind of see how they fit sort of thing, and, and found that the the shutter the, the 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 molding around the window casing was actually cut off before it would hit the shutter. So the shutter would lie flat against the wall, and and that. I see no trace of of it being sort of cut and pried off of it. So that was sort of an intriguing detail again that I I had never really noticed. Uh, so that the shutter would lie flat um, in 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 this room. And this is what the rest of the parlor looks like. It's a very the room is not a huge room, and um, and it, but it's beautifully detailed. Um, the mantelpiece is almost. Oversized for the size of the wall that it's on. It's on just basically the chimney, the chimney wall that's going up, and and the 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 ends of the top of the mantle sort of project out about 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 five or six inches on either side. Um, but it, it's a it, it's a great statement, and um, and and it's quite beautiful. On the other side of the hall, where the chimney had been taken down, uh, they also had removed a wall. The next room over, so they made this into a much larger room, and uh, and 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 Carlton sort of, I, I suppose, decided that this would be an appropriate room to make into a his Victorian room, and uh, and and be able to use Victorian furniture, and and so they put down a broad loom, it's like a broad loom rug and Victorian wallpaper and curtains, and and because it didn't have a fireplace, it sort of was even even fit, fit better. This really doesn't have anything to do with the the house so much as I was sort of gathering every time everywhere I would go and see a picture, I would take pictures with my phone of different of the house. And I, I ended up with two pictures of this house. And I noticed that one picture didn't have the child isn't sitting in the center of the picture. And I went, what is going on here? I, Fred, do you know what I I don't know what I maybe there's family history there, but one of the children died, so he was, he was, uh, 
So he was sort of erased, I guess, from the, or at least in some of the pictures. But, but and that's sort of like almost like Photoshop. Somebody went with like little ink drops and sort of put the um, uh, put the boulders in. So anyway, that was just a something I discovered. I guess I didn't realize I was going to. The next house is 1815-16, the church house in Adamsville. This has the same, it's federal house, much fancier. This is built for a merchant who died, unfortunately, the year that it was finished or before it was finished, but it's a grandiose house. This is, and it's five bays, center hall. Uh, but actually this, I don't think is the front of the building, the front of the, this base is the street. But the side of the building, I believe, is the front. And, and it's really unique that they built this house was built with two identical doorways on one, the one on the right north side faces the road. The one on the west side faces the side yard and the wall, and maybe had a driveway there and was a sort of a drop-off spot. And it has the blade that those lintels over the windows, just like the Brown Owl house. Uh, but in this case, it has much fancier, um, fancier doorways, and it has a pediment on the one gable end, which would read more as a, a little bit more like a Greek revival. But it also has the two flanking chimneys, a little bit more inset um, on on what I consider the front of the building, which is facing the side yard. And I'll explain more why I think that. Um, when I was looking at the house, the trim on the west side was buried a little bit into the siding and it was more proud sticking out on the other side. And when I looked at it closer, there, were, there, was, there was another layer of wood underneath the shingles. And so I think that this side, the west side was clabbered uh, originally the same way the Brown Owl House had clabbers on the main facade and the other facades were shingled. And the, the two doors are, uh, the two entryways are almost identical with the fan lights and side lights. But what's different, what's differentiating them is the additional panels that are on the west side door, which again would have been more prestigious and be a little bit uh, more impressive. And so that, that would be the door that they would want their guests to enter. And perhaps they use the other door for, for business um, purposes, or that was the intention. This is the west side, main entry has the staircase and the two parlor rooms are, are adjacent on both sides. Uh, this, those are the two parlors, north parlor and south parlor. The north parlor, you can see there's a door that sort of enters into a small vestibule that would could access the north door. But, but really, I think for this case, the, the, the parlors are, are nice and spacious. Uh, going back to the fire hall, you see something similar. Um, the, the, that little trim underneath the tread are identical to the Brown Owl House. Um, and side by side, you, you really, you, you can barely tell the difference. So this is really pretty clear that, presumably it's clear that, that this was probably the same carpenter or builder that was involved in both houses. Um, and both of them are sort of high style, probably the best houses at the time being built here. And, um, and so they, they were using the best builder that, that they could get. Um, and further more, I look at the, the, um, uh, the Newell post, that, that the post at the bottom is also an exact, exact duplicate really of what was at the Brown Owl House, which is sort of unusual. And then when I went into the dining room, there's the same cutoff uh, detail on the, on the uh, molding so that the shutters could lie flat. And it's definitely more than a coincidence. I think they probably figured they were six miles apart. So who would ever see the two together? And finally, I just wanted to throw in the slide. This is, uh, this was built as a water tower in 1905, um, and and it was a way to sort of have a slow, a slow drip of water going up to the top to a to a tank at the top of the building uh, that then would provide enough gravity that it would 
it would end up reaching the second story of the of the house um, because it was a, it was a little bit higher than than the house. So so it was sort of an intriguing thing. But it's also kind of neat because it's a it's sort of a colonial revival uh, period, and the windows are are sort of are the same as same as the house, and it looks like it sort of fits with the house. So I know I've sort of talked for about forty five minutes. I have about probably fifteen or twenty minutes left. We were thinking that maybe we would stop for questions or a little break. Is that what we want to do? Okay. It has it has diamond diamond pane leaded windows. Yeah. No, that would have been I mean probably probably a piece of piece of uh, oil cloth was what was probably the earlier. Um, so that would have been something that you would have that that glass probably um, would have would have been made in Britain or something and brought over at that time and and so so it was very valuable and 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 just these little. Um, and when they were doing the restora restoration of the building, they sort of found th that size window. And if you look at other stone ender buildings from that period, uh, the ones that have been restored by, um, uh, I always think of it as Spania, but uh, New England Preservation, um, that they, they, they have those same size windows and also same type of window. So it was a fairly, it was a common uh, early, uh, uh, Sort of late 17th century uh, window typing. I'm just going to repeat the question for the people on Zoom. The question was whether the lead casement windows that we have at the Wilbur House, uh, why they were distinct, if they were fancier or not. Um, anybody else? And they would have been quickly replaced by something else as soon as something else was available. But that's White, white, I'm sorry. Is the chimney painted white? And yeah. Glass, right? so is there any significance to that? It seems like a very common. Uh, yeah, I, I don't so know that it was. The, the question was Is there significance to there being a white painted chimney with a black stripe around the rim? I don't, I don't think, I'm, I'm not sure historically that that would have been, that that was a, something that they would have done. Um, so. It may, it may be just a way to, to have protected the brick, and and since the soot and dirt and soot, soot and smoke and everything are coming out of the top of the building, you paint the top. Uh, it doesn't show the soot. I think. Keep going. All right, we we'll just slog through the rest of it. The best is last, though, so you need to stay. Um, the Kempton House is on Warren's Point, 1871. Uh, Victorian period. Um, now we're in a, in the manufacturing period, so there's lots of product and, and, and higher styles are sort of readily available off the shelf. Um, and this this I would call an, an Italian age vernacular. It's it's sort of a it's a farmhouse uh, Italian age that has some Italian age beats, but also has some other details that have been mixed in here, um, probably a little bit later. Um, but really, what's what is Italianate here is is the cupola uh, and the uh, and the verandas having the verandas around the house and the uh, the window caps and the way the way the the, uh, the house is, is sort of organized. The cupola is, is really quite quite beautiful uh, with the the, the pointed um, uh, almost gothic looking uh, windows in, in in the cupola and then. This beautiful sort of bell-shaped uh, uh, roof and and this sort of massive uh, finial on top. Uh, the also what would be typical Italianate is the the round or arch top uh, panels or or glass uh, panels in in the door and the uh, and and the milk glass uh, the white glass doorknobs and these are all things that again being sort of made made to not made to order but just were made and available. 
you can sort of see, I can't resist mentioning it, but you can sort of see this detail here on this window. I think that this is sort of a later sort of colonial revival detail trying to make that window, that center window look a little bit more like a, a Palladian window. But I, then these doors, um, again, you would see these doors on any variety of styles that were available at this time, uh, but they're very high style. And here they are in little rural, little Compton, but these beautiful uh, cut glass uh, doors and, um, and, and here they are on a farm in, in, uh, on Warren's Point. And the same thing is true on the interior, this beautiful newel post and the parquet floor and, and the uh, balusters. This is probably all black walnut, uh, which was often used, American walnut, uh, used for, uh, for, for these types of milling purposes because it's such a beautiful wood. But you would see this, this same newel post and that same baluster you would see in a house that was a mansard house or a, a late Greek revival house, perhaps, or, or an early Victorian house. So the, 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 these, these were almost interchangeable. What is sort of a nice detail, I think, is, is, is this little uh, the detail under the tread. Uh, it's, it's, it's very unique. And I don't think, um, I, I think that was probably done, put together by a carpenter um, and by his own design. Even the parquet floor probably came in pieces from from sort of where somebody they then could join it all together. They uh, it was it, it often uh, and a little bit later they actually came on sheets of a uh, 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 burlap and glued down, and you would just you would put them down and then nail them down. So so it looks much fancier and and much uh, uh, much more skilled than you than you might have had as 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 the laborer. Uh, in, in, in a rural area. Uh, the same thing's true with the, the woodwork in the, around the door casings, these very big, heavy, uh, wood, the heavy woodwork that's all original, 18, 1870 period, same thing with these sort of massive doors with these big, huge panels and moldings, and then the beautiful uh, mercury glass uh, doorknobs, uh, which are very, very high style. Again, you sort of you wouldn't sort of associate these with being in at this time. Warren's Point wasn't developed as a summer community, and this was really built as a as a farmhouse and and, and a well-to-do farmhouse. But it, but but it, you wouldn't expect to see such high high quality. But it, but it was basically available uh, and and uh, what what people were doing. And sort of sleuthing around, you see the same building, and and here you have a double window, and you look at the size of the glass in the double window. That was that was probably good size glass for seventeen, I uh, for uh, eighteen seventy one, but then as glass got bigger and bigger, probably around I would say around the, the turn of the century or so, they took what was another double window that was similar to this at the other end of the room. And they took out the mullion between the two windows and made it a plate glass picture window in in probably 1900. And, and it, it's because it's, it's quite old, and, and but it's but it but it really required having the technology to make plate glass and make it accessible that somebody could buy it and and put it in their own house. And if you look if you look at the windowsill and the header of the window, you can see markings where the mullion uh, was attached originally. And lastly, the, 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 the has, um, has the mantelpiece, uh, the fire, the, the chimney on this building was, was not in the store. I forgot to point it out at the very beginning, the historic photograph did not have the chimney. So the chimney was added, the fireplace was added, the mantelpiece and the French doors all looks to me to be sort of early 20th century and probably and also the, the beams that go across the ceiling. So it was kind of almost a, what more of a, a colonial revival uh, treatment of, of this room uh, as, as, the, as the living room, even though it's, it continued to reuse the, the original beautiful heavy black walnut uh, casings around what was probably originally uh, windowed.
Now, the pH to resistance, this is the best, best, the most amazing house. It's a, it's a tour de force, I think, um, stylistically and, and as an artistic, uh, artistic sort of monument to, to architecture. This is, the, this is also built in the Victorian period. It's 1887. Uh, it's the Mill House on West Main Road. It's a shingle style and arts and crafts movement. Um, and what arts and crafts movement um, is really uh, an aesthetic movement that started in, in England probably around 1865 or so. Uh, William Morris and uh, the, the, the nice wallpapers and, and the sort of cottages that were being built in England sort of have this romantic uh, connotation to them. Um, in the United States, it was around, the, around 1887 actually, it was sort of coined as an arts and crafts movement in this country. And, and it really uh, is a response to the industrialization and the sort of dehumanization dehuman, of industry and was, wanted to go back to handcraft and hand, handmade products. So, so this is uh, a very sort of individualistic handmade building and, and uh, is, is remarkable. What they did was they they took a windmill that was farther down the field, and the windmill was built in 1812. So that's that's one of my federal period buildings, and they moved the windmill up and then built a little shingle shingle style house around the windmill, and basically incorporated it or sort of embraced, I guess it almost looks like done that it's sort of like embracing this, this windmill and made it part of the house. And you can't get much more romantic in your feeling for perhaps than, than this. And, uh, and it's, it's really quite amazing. This was um, designed and, and executed by uh, Sidney Burley who had who summered down here is the painter that we all think of him as a, a painter, but he was actually a uh, also a uh, a craftsman and and uh, and did made furniture and and did uh, plaster work and and uh, as well as painting. And Sidney Burley and architect Edmund Wilson in Providence well, both were members of the Providence Art Club, and they collaborated on a number of buildings in Providence and um, and and decorative art projects in Providence and they uh, together were the sort of architectural team and artistic team uh, to design to design this this sort of compilation of the windmill and and the house and and they actually were so interested in the arts and crafts movement that they they formed a, a guild a, 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 an artist guild that sort of represented uh, all the decorative artists that you might use in in, rent, in decorating a house, and um, and so the artist guild represented carpenters and plasters and stained glass people and decorative artists, and they they renovated the interiors of several houses in Providence and uh, also worked on the Fleur de Lis building at the Providence Art Club or built the Fleur de Lis building at the Art Club as well, and and um, and, and this is a, this is the one of the one of the better examples of a house, that, a residential house that they um, that, that they ever constructed. The house has has also not gone through very many changes at all. It's 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 always been, I think, respected and revered by whoever the owners have been of the house. And um, both the interior and exterior still read very much exactly the way they did uh, when when the house was built. There are a couple of changes that you can see when you when you look closely, uh, one is that this, these three windows here uh, are now enclosing this porch back here. And the other thing is that there was a sort of a shed added here, I think for a bathroom. Uh, and so they, they sort of changed the, how this, this worked uh, here to get, the more, head, get more headroom uh, uh, for, that, for that space. Also in this photograph, you see, Besides sort of read see this post here in the corner and looks like 
sort of the similar post here. So that was actually the the um, uh, the, 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 the held the wheel on the windmill. I, I don't know what that's called. Um, the, this, like the piston of the windmill, and was repurposed, and they cut that. They cut the the piston into piece into a couple pieces, and and made it into uh, is the axle exactly. Thank you. Um, made it into in the corner post. Unfortunately, that hasn't survived, um, and and is no longer there. But it, but it's sort of an interesting uh, thing to to note that or just shows how much they were trying to reuse. Also, the lattice, the, the sort of broad segmental arch. Uh, Lattice work over the porch um, is is no longer there. Just wanted to show the Florida Lee building. The Florida Lee building was built was built actually one year before the mill house. So this is sort of where they practiced what they were going to do on the inside. Um, but this was this was built uh, again by by Wilson and Burley. Uh, this was Sydney Burley's uh, studios and down the street from the art club. You can see Burley wasn't shy about putting his, his name on things or letting people know that he was involved. And he has his big plaque there uh, where the Fleur de Lis is. And then he also put in the in the top uh, top left-hand corner, uh, put uh, himself up there with a little tam uh looking down at everybody. But these same, the same technique of sort of uh, Carving and creating sort of reliefs in the plaster uh, they used extensively inside the mill house. So here we are inside, and you can just see how amazing it is the way the windmill. I mean, this this big strut that's coming down is one of the struts of the windmill is coming down, and it's coming down into the into the dining room of the of the new part of the house, and so it's sort of like reaching into the new new part of the house and. And then the, the living room is on the other side. And it's, um, and it's again, 1812, and it's all post and beam construction throughout the, the windmill, which has all been reused for bedrooms and, and, uh, and, and hallways upstairs. The door, again, sort of has this, evokes sort of like this English cottage, ancient English cottage kind of house. And over the door, they actually give you a little bit of history about the house and, and he carved into the plaster uh, or into the stucco. This windmill was built about the year 1812 and was set here in 1887. So, so it sort of documents what, what they did. And then they also did these amazing reliefs with these galleon ships with, with great flags floating above them uh, on, on this back wall. And, Created these sort of um, what looks like they should be tiles, but they're really just impressed into the stucco lines and and sort of sometimes decorative details, and then painted so that they look like tiles. And again, it looks very English to me. And then and then and also all the half timbering and everything uh, sort of also evokes this sort of very early English feeling to it, even though this was a working windmill. And here's a close up of the galleon. Uh, there's another little, little quote over that's over one of the windows saying, charmed magic casements opening on the foam. So you can look down to the ocean. And then little reliefs of uh, a, 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 an osprey holding a little fish. And then some leaf that they must have picked up from the garden outside and, and sort of stuck into the plaster. So they created a, a, a plaster, uh, a plaster uh, inset there, and then sort of all this sort of arts and craftsiness is then um, sort of juxtaposed to what looks like a much more formal interior on in, in the newer section. It's all mostly reused materials, and uh, and and isn't uh, is is much funkier than, than than it looks like. Uh, this this mantelpiece was 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 reclaimed from a building in Providence and probably an old building in Providence because colonial revival mantelpieces weren't being built yet. And and this uh, so this is sort of like pre-colonial revival by reusing uh, what looks like a, a very nice uh, federal period 
penalties. But I don't know the history of it exactly, except that I know that it was reused from a building in Providence. And then you can see that it sort of communicates directly with the living room, which is also really interesting um, in that it creates an open, it's an open floor plan between the living room and the dining room, which is also almost unheard of in 1887. Uh, so it's also very modern in, in, in that way and in, in the way the space is used. This looks very formal as well, and but you kind of notice the door, I don't think was ever varnished. So the, the door is like this, this sort of rough finish on the door, but it's, but it's a wood door and has a nice, nice uh, bronze or brass uh, doorknob. And it has nice wainscoting that all looks very fancy, but they did the same trick at the art club. The wainscoting is actually um, early, early um, 19th century, or earlier, um, shutters, in the interior shutters uh, from different houses, and they basically folded all the shutters out and put them, joined them together, and made and made paneled wainscoting, reusing uh, shutters from old houses. And it's it's quite a quite an effective uh, way to to do that. But it's it's sort of this idea of reuse of material, and uh, and also being sort of crafty in how you do it. The only thing that was changed in the house, which is probably not that regrettable, except there are some charming parts about the old kitchen, but it was basically an unworkable kitchen and had a back stair that sort of went right into the kitchen, which also was removed. Uh, but they did, they put a new kitchen in and, but managed to uh, save, there was like this little path here, at the side of the kitchen that would go into the dining room. They, they saved that over, over at the other end of, uh, of that kitchen. So, so it's actually very sympathetically done, and uh, and it's, it's a nice kitchen, nice big modern kitchen. But it it it's it's about the only uh, modern intrusion uh, that they did in the in this most recent restoration. So now we're going to go upstairs, um, and again we're, we're sort of proceeding upstairs, sort of through the through the the window. And so we're going in, in, out of the windmill and all the different angles of the windmill are all sort of competing with, with, with the straight edges of the wall and going up the stairs. And then here's the, the whole wainscoting in the staircase is all of this plaster uh, that's been scored and imprinted and then painted to look like tile. Uh, very interesting and, and very, very uh, dramatic. And, and this is after this, the building has just been restored uh, by, by new owners. And they were very careful to try to not disturb any of, uh, any of the original uh, uh, art fa fabric of, of, the, of, the, of the building. And it's really pretty amazing. Again, another, another dog friend. And now we're at the hallway upstairs on the left is the windmill sort of coming down into the hallway. And if you go through that door, you're in a nice bedroom, uh, which I'm not gonna show you because you can, you'll see, it's much more, of an, much more exciting to sort of go into these rooms without knowing what you're gonna see. And then the stair goes up to the third floor and up at the third floor, we're now up to the top of the windmill. And so the third floor in the windmill is this beautiful room with, with the ceiling and this panel at the top of the stairs and inside the room was where um, the owner of the building had his study. So his office or study was in this room. And, and again, they put another, another one of these little plaques in the wall and, and it, it says, he to his study goes and there amidst his magic books and arts of sundry kinds, he seeks out mighty charms to trouble sleepy minds. And apparently there's a quote from the Fairy Queen by Edward Spencer. I, don't, I have no reference for that, but, but, that's, but that the name Spencer is at the bottom. And, and then this is the ceiling of, of this, this wonderful room, which is, which is just, just unbelievable. And uh, so they sort of took this windmill and repurposed it and made it into this amazing art piece in, in a way. And uh, and it's it's really and it's also survived almost un, un, untouched. Uh, 
uh, are unaltered uh, to this day, which is also remarkable given all the other and how much change has occurred in all of them. This one has, has a certain uh, reverence to it. And that, that plaque at the top of the stairs has these two handprints and can you guess what the initials SB stand for? Sidney Burley. And so his ego got him again and he, he had to put his initials in the date and stuck his handicraft hand into the plaster. And, uh, and so that's, that's fun to see too. And when you put your hands next to them, his hands were tiny, they're, they're tiny little hands. They only come to sort of the first joint of my, my fingers. <laughs> but uh, so that's, that's, the, uh, that's the end. Thank you. Um, if there are any questions, I, it was a really, um, for me, this was sort of a treat. I spent the last uh, couple of months kind of taking the pictures and trying to figure out what to do with them. Uh, I mean, I, I, unfortunately, I, mean, I have like 300 pictures that I've taken, and then I had to kind of sort of figure out how to make it not be a four hour lecture, but I got my 45 minute lecture down to about almost an hour and a half. So that's it. All right, well, thank you. I hope you all go on the tour. Uh, if for nothing else, it's worth the, wind, the windmill house. The, the mill house is, uh, is really just, a, it's, it's a national, it's a, it's, a, it's a national landmark, number one, as is the Florida Lee building. And, um, and it is, is worthy of that. It's, it, there's nothing else, there really is nothing else like it that I've seen in the United States. Anything.